Our next speaker is Carlton Gibson. He'll be presenting on growing old gracefully on being a career programmer. Carlton is the newest Django Fellow. He's a core team member for Django REST Framework and a maintainer of Django Filter. Um, he plays some Pokemon Go. He is a husband and a father of four, and he enjoys cooking, hats, and philosophy, but not necessarily in that order. So, um, and I also, I, I want to just thank you all for being here, and I would also like to go ahead and thank the organizers for putting on such a wonderful conference. So let's give our organizers a round of applause, too. Now I'm trying to think if I know any jokes. Does anyone know any jokes? Can anyone tell me a joke and then I will relay the joke? Ah, uh, thank you. Would you like to hear a dirty joke? <laughs> Always. A white horse fell in the mud. All right, that's Hello. all I've got. Thank you, Carlton. Thank you, Lacey. Hello, can you hear me? Yes? Okay, fine. Uh, now I'm wishing I gave a technical talk. Um, okay, growing old gracefully on being a career programmer. Um, I'm going to talk about building a pr career in programming for the long haul. Um, we'll see. To bootstrap, that, I'm, to bootstrap that, I'm going to talk a little bit about my career so far and tell you a, a story about that. With that in hand, we'll then go on and discuss the topic and hopefully I can make some points. Um, it says here in big letters, talk slowly, talk slowly. Um, fine, so who am I? I'm Carlton Gibson. If I want to get serious, I put a doctor in front of that. Um, here's my avatar. I'm at Carlton Gibson pretty much everywhere, on GitHub, on Stack Overflow, on Twitter. I'm not on Twitter very much. Um, Python package index, read the docs, or Carlton Gibson. You can find me. Um, I have a microblog blog account, which I'm just Carlton. I post occasionally. Um, but who am I? Well. I'm a long-term Django user. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to university. I studied economics. Um, I wanted to be a merchant banker. Um, <laughs> in my second year, I discovered philosophy. I became addicted to philosophy. I did a master's in the history and philosophy of science. And in the end, I did a PhD in the philosophy of science. So I finished in the early 2000s. And this was the time of around the YouTube buyout and all of these, these things. It was an exciting time. I thought, yeah, I'm going to get into the web. And for me, there's, there's two ways into web. Either you do computer, or in that, those days there seemed to be. There's two, you either you do computer science and you get into ASP or Java or something, or the other way was this, <sighs> PHP. Um, so I began with PHP and MySQL and had lots of fun there. And then one day I went to a conference called FOA, the Future of Web Apps. It was amazing. They were great, they were great team. Um, and there everyone was talking about this thing called Django. Django, Django, you must try Django, Django, Django. OK, so I went home and I thought, yeah, well, I'll look it up. Typed it into Google, locked on the web, website. And it said, the web framework for perfectionists with deadlines. I thought, that's me. Um, so I've been hooked ever since. Um, it wasn't just Django, though. It was Python. You, uh, PHP's come a long way, but f at that time, it was very much the, the proverbial glass of iced water to someone in hell. Um, about the same time, this guy got up and he pulled out that thing out of his pocket. Um, Apple reinvents the phone with iPhone. That was the press release from 2007, and that's what they did. And I jumped onto that, and I thought, wow, brilliant iOS. I spent a good couple of years um, building, well, I guess, soulless apps for glamorous brands in London agencies. <laughs> um, and that was fun. Um, but it wasn't just UI work. What people wanted was a back end to go with it. And I, I, I knew Django. So I, I, I basically built a, a small sub career um, building the UI side of it, on, of an app, but with a, a back end that went with it with, um, for a data sync back end solution. And for that, I needed something to, to work with. So I discovered Django REST Framework, a powerful and flexible toolkit for building web APIs. Um, I got involved early there. And one day, Tom sent an email to the mailing list saying he needed help, Tom Christie. He said he needed help. He needed help with Stack Overflow. He needed help with the mailing list. He needed help with GitHub, because he couldn't maintain it on his own 
anymore. This was before the Kickstarter. So I got involved. I started on Stack Overflow, and I started on the mailing list, and I um, got involved in GitHub. And so all of a sudden, I became a core team member on Django REST framework. Um, I was the second sort of guy. <laughs> um, and that was how I got into open source. And I worked on Django REST framework for a while, and then I became the maintainer of Django Filter, and I became the maintainer of Django Crispy Forms. And then from January, I became the Django Fellow, uh, the new Django Fellow, along with Tim Graham. Tim's been doing it for three years now, and he wanted to step back a bit, and so he's, he stepped back a bit, and I've stepped in. Um, I'll talk more about the fellowship program later in the talk, um, but we're essentially contracted by the Django Software Foundation to work on Django itself and maintain, um, maintaining Django itself. Um, so, so far, so good. Like, that's, that's a very short and potted history. The point I want to make from it is that it's just a normal career. I'm just a normal programming programmer. I haven't done anything exciting. There's no software billions. There's no golden Lamborghinis. Um, I've just had a dozen or so years having fun building software. Um, I work about half time on open source. I'm very fortunate to do that. And I spend the remaining time, like many, many, many of you, um, working with, on, on, with Django for various clients on a freelance basis. Um, so what's the problem? Well, it's simple. I'm getting old. Um, apparently, programmers, before you turn 40, you better have a plan B. Um, this was some article on Hacker News <laughs> recently. Well, I turned 40 in November, and I don't have a plan B. <laughs> um, I think I'm in trouble. It turns out that if you're old in program, you, you, you can't get a job. Over 30, you were too old for a tech job in China. Well, you can take China out there, and you could put Silicon Valley, or London, or Berlin, or anywhere you like. You can't blame the hiring managers. Right? They, they advertise for a Django programmer, and two people turn, turned up. One of them's me, I'm old, and I'm expensive, and one of them's young and, and cheap. And the, program, um, the, the hiring manager has a problem. For her, the Django programmer is a bit of a commodity. I explain my history. I explain you know, why, why I'm worth more. She believes me, but I'm so much more expensive. So who does she hire? She hires the young person. And I don't blame her. That's exactly right. So you can't get a job. If you've got a job, you can't keep it. Cutting old heads at IBM. This was a... Um, these two articles, these were just things I saw whilst writing the talk. These articles come up every week, right? You can find them. So what did IBM do? They had a load of expensive senior analysts who they constructively dismissed over the course of years. Oh, no, you've got to go and work in a remote office. But I've got a family. I don't want to live in a work in a remote office. You've got, they get rid of you. So if you've got a job, you can't keep it. And this is against a backdrop, right? a, a, a social backdrop, of the so-called demographic crisis. We have, we're living longer and longer and longer, so we have an aging population because of that. In the West, we combine that with a falling birth rate, and so the, the population is becoming more and more and more skewed towards um, old age. This is why we, when I was studying economics, they taught me that uh, this is why we encourage immigration, because we want people to come and help fill in the, the demographic hole. The dem Immigration leads to political backlash. Look at Brexit. Look at voting, you know, across Europe now. There's there's problems. But pensions become unaffordable, so we have eroded pension rights. There's strikes in France. Whose journey here was delayed because of strikes in France over pension rights? In the UK, there's an extended strike now in academia over pension rights. These these, these stories aren't unfamiliar. I hope. Um, so who wants to stay in programming? In management, anyone? Because <laughs> that's, the, that's the, the stereotype, right? If you stop programming, you become a manager. But I'm an OK programmer. I know nothing about management. <laughs> um, so the question, I guess, is when are you going to hang up your programming boots? I've got a simple answer. For me, it's never. 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 I look at Donald Knuth. He's 80. He's still involved, right? <laughs> right? That's what I want to do. Now, I very much doubt I'll be working full-time when I'm 80, but as long as 
my mind hold out, I still want to be there. I still want to be crafting. I still want to be creating. Okay. The flip side of the demographic crisis is that we have so much more time now than we ever had before. You know, we, we, we live longer. But 70 is like the new 50. It's not just that you live longer, but quality of life is extended into old age. There's no reason why you have to stop at 55 or 60 or 65. Or you can keep going. Always, always, always with luck regarding to health. Just because you're old, it doesn't mean you're out, out of the game. So what if you just want to keep programming? Hang on a second. So I'll give a couple of general strategies and then some more detailed points. First general strategy is look outside the tech bubble. Right? Many, many people here seem to have already done this. I've talked to people that we work in medicine, we work in, we work in whatever industry, right? that isn't tech. Software is, uh, well, where well, software is. Um, Emma talked yesterday about AI, um, automating jobs away, but it's not just with um, AI. Software is eating the world, right? Software will eat the world, this famous essay. Um, who's going to program that? Well, you are, I am, we are. Um, there's massive demand outside of the tech bubble. So just because you know, software startups in Silicon Valley or China or London or Berlin don't want you when you're over 30, doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of companies out there in the real economy that do. Um, I kind of think Emma had put up a slide about the, um, the levelers, about the Industrial Revolution. Um, I kind of think we're, that's where we're at now. We're, we're in a, a kind of another industrial revolution. Pe people who don't program now are kind of like characters in a Dickens novel who can't read. Right? They, need to, they need to hire a scribe who does the reading and writing for them. Well, that's us. Now, I hope in a generation, um, computer literacy will be as universal as literacy. But right now, we have, a, we have an economic niche, and there's... There's a massive demand for that. So look outside the tech bubble. That's the first step. And then always ask, be asking, what's next? What's next? What's next? Now, freelancers live and die by this. It's called your pipeline. And it is the most important part of your business if you're a freelancer. You can have a bad project. You'll be OK as long as you've got a good pipeline. But if you've got a good project, you're still in trouble if you've got a bad pipeline. A, um, there was a Bill Gates line that I wanted to find, but I couldn't, I couldn't find the exact reference. But the idea was that Bill Gates ran Microsoft wanting to have enough money in the bank such that Microsoft could go a year without making a single sale. Now, that might be asking a bit much, but it's a nice exercise. Could you go a year? Well, OK, that's a lot. Could you go six months? Could you go three months? Could you go a month? Right? Try to have a bit of reserve is a good idea. But whether you're a freelancer or not, thinking what's next is vital. If you're an employee, your great question is how do you get more money? Right? You can maybe get a small raise, just your annual review. You do, do a good job, turn up on time, do a good job. About, you know, you'll get a percentage raise. But if you want a big raise, you need a promotion. What's the best way of getting promotion? Well, make yourself attractive to other employers. Make your employer think you're going to leave. If they think that, they'll give you a promotion. If you're an employer, if you run a company, you should be asking, well, how do I develop my employees? They need more money. They're going to need more money. So you're, you should be thinking as an employer, how do I build the structures that will support that? If you're not doing that, you won't keep your staff. If you're, if you're an employee and your company isn't doing that, well, you know, you'll be off. You'll get a new company. Anybody wants to talk to me about pipelines and things like that, do afterwards. It's, it's one of my favorite topics. I'll talk forever. So look outside the tech bubble. Always be asking what's next. And they're the general strategies. I want to then highlight three more specific ones. So the first one is be diligent. 
Now, what does that mean? The software industry have this entirely, has this entirely wrong, and this is why we look outside of tech. Because for the software com uh, industry, it's all 100-hour weeks and constant schedule pressures and deadline this week and another deadline next week. The culture of shipping, you have to ship real artist ship. Well, there's something in that. Real artist ship, yes, okay. But it, we, it becomes a rod, this mantra that you must ship becomes something we can beat ourselves with. We have a phrase, death marches. Yeah, we shipped the product, it was a real death march. What is that? Let's blow that, let's blow software. It's not 100 hour weeks, it's not unlimited, um, unlimited vacation so you don't take anyway. The number one priority is self-care. Right? This is what you must be diligent about. This is about the pace in which you do it. The key phrase is day in, day out. Day in, day out. If you're going to do the same thing day in, day out for five years or 10 years or 20 years, or you can't be doing um, the 100 hour weeks. You can go to a networking event and you can work long hours at the networking event. You can work hard to meet a deadline. You can push to meet that deadline. You can ship the product, whatever it is you've got to do, but that has a direct cost to you. And so you have to ask, where is the time that recoup recoups that? Where do I get that back? And if you, that time isn't there, well, you will suffer. Again, if, you're, if, you're, if your company doesn't provide that, if your company puts deadlines and then puts another deadline and you work hard to meet that deadline, but then there's no rest afterwards, well, that's a direct cost to you. You can't maintain that. It is a marathon, not a sprint. Self-care, self-care. The side on family here. If you have a family, if you have a young family, take the time out to be with that family while they're young. Because they'll grow up, they'll leave home, and you'll still have loads of career left in which to um, catch up, or you won't catch up, but in which to carry on. My, my subjective career, I have four children. My subjective career process went like, sort of like this, and then it flatlined, and it's still flatlined, and it's still flatlined, and, it's still flatlined, and eventually it'll, they'll go and I can go, get on back to work. Um, family isn't for everybody, but if you have a family, make sure, make sure you take that, because it's precious. Self-care. Self-care. The part of being diligent is to eliminate distractions. I refuse to work to death, so I better be efficient when I am working. Um, it's an, a notification culture that we live in. Um, email. Facebook, Slack, um, constant news stories, phones all, always on, always connected. Um, so there's two sides to this, um, I think. One is addiction. We see, pe we see a lot of articles now about um, addiction to mobile phones. Um, and I tried to look up some decent research on this, and the best version of the story I could find was that if you put rats in a cage and you give them a button that dispenses food, they'll press it when they're hungry and they'll go away and do other things and they'll come back and they'll press the button when they're hungry and they'll get some more food. But if you make it so that that button very rarely gives out food, but sometimes does, then they'll actually learn that it sometimes gives out food and they'll just sit there tapping the button constantly. And as far as this variable reinforcement it's called, you can look it up on Wikipedia. Um, emails like this, and Facebook is like this, and Slack is like this. The notifications are like this. Sometimes they're great, sometimes they're gold dust, but most of the time uh, it's just noise. But we find ourselves constantly reaching into our pockets, constantly checking the notifications, constantly, well, absorbed in that. There's no way of doing work. The other aspect is procrastination. Okay. It's a bit oversimplification, but procrastination is often caused by anxiety. I don't know if anxiety is the right word, but the anxiety is caused by you've got this block of underspecified work that needs to be done. Now, the real work is to do the specifying so that you can get on with it, but what do we do? Oh, I'll reach for the, I'll just check how I can use. 
So we reach for the distraction. So part of being diligent is to eliminate those distractions. Um, now, I'm a software developer. How do I do? I use software. Um, so I'll just tell you some of the software I use. And, um, you know, you, I, re I recommend these apps, and you can use similar or, or not. The first one I use is um, it's called Timeout. Um, and this could be part of self-care, but I, I was going to tell you about a few pieces of software, so I put them all together. What Timeout does is it, um, it puts up a, it, you define breaks, and it puts up a barrier over your screen so you can't use your computer. So I have a short break every 15 minutes, which is just 10, 15 seconds, which is enough to do this. Oh, oh. <sighs> Thank you, that's better. And then I have a longer break every hour, every 50 minutes, 10 minutes. So I have to, and it locks my computer. I'm like, ah, I can't do anything. So I have to stand up, I have to walk away, I go and make coffee, I hang out the way, whatever I do. Right? But it's step away from your computer. Yeah, I very much recommend timeout. Um, you can only work concentratedly for 50 minutes at a time. Your brain just drops off the cliff after that. So you have to have these breaks. You can only do that for two or three hours at a time, or three or four hours at a time, and then you have to have a decent break. So this is still self-care, right? Take those breaks. Um, look after yourself, time out. The next thing I use is called Focus. Um, and what Focus does is it blocks apps and websites. And so, oh, well, I'll just look at Tweetbot. Oh no, Tweetbot is a distracting app. I'm gonna close it for you. Ah. That's quite annoying, um, but it, it, it's effective. And you can set schedules. So for me, my morning time is just my apps. My morning time is when I, I make my living. If, 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 my, if my morning time is ruined, I'm, well, that's my business down the drain. So I, I, have, a I have focus set, set in the morning. I then have a, a bit of a break at lunchtime so that you know, if I want to check the news sites, I can. And then I have it again for a session in the afternoon. So I have these two focus sessions. Um, focus, very good. And then I follow that up with another app called Rescue Time. And what Rescue Time does is monitors what you're doing. Well, it does a couple of things, but it monitors what you're doing primarily. It's just a, a background activity monitor. I think you can get that on, on, even on Android phones. I don't know quite how that works. But. And so it monitors what you're doing. And then once a week, it'll send you an email. And it'll tell you exactly what you did. And this is fantastic. Oh, wow, I spent four hours reading news on Catalan independence. I better add that to focus, because <laughs> I, can't be, I can't be spending that much time as much as I you know, care about the political situation in Spain. Um, and then for Rescue Time also, has, that email is super useful. It's super useful. You think, oh, I'm efficient, I'm efficient. Oh, hang on, but I spent, my RSS reader is my second most used app. Uh, you can't hide. Um, and it's private, it's not your boss seeing it, it's you seeing it. Right? Um, and the second thing it does, Rescue Time has a second layer of, um, of, of blocking. It acts like focus again. Um, and so I have goals. I say, look, I, I, I like the news, I, I'm happy to read it, but I don't want to be on it forever. So it, after 20 minutes of news consumption in the day, outside of my focus time sessions, but in those extra times, if I'm on the news for more than 20 minutes, Rescue time kicks in and it blocks everything then. I can't go to Amazon, I can't, you know, you can work around it, but it acts as that, that, that barrier. If I spend more on net, on more than X amount of time on news, blocked. Brilliant. So combined, these three tools, they stop me clicking on distractions just because I'm addicted to them. And they stop me reaching for this, the distractions just because there's work to be done. Right? Addiction and procrastination. What about the phone? Well, that's a good question. I have a simple policy for the phone. Delete everything. I don't have Facebook. I, well, I deleted my Facebook account, but that's a different story. I don't have Twitter on the phone. Um, I don't have Slack on the phone. I've installed Slack for this conference, and when I leave, I will delete it again, because I can't have that syn synchronous notification source in my pocket, because if I have that, I will look at it. So I delete it. I use, um, I use a, a, a blocker called a Blocker X. It's just one of these ad blockers, but it also enables you to block um, URLs. 
And so if I find myself on my phone loading up the news site, because oh, I like the news, oh, it's great, isn't it? If I find myself looking at the same news website again and again and again, I just block it. And then it's annoying. You, you try and load it. Oh, Safari cannot load this. But it stops me getting into this cycle. Remember, I'm, I refuse to work 100-hour weeks, so I have to be efficient. So I can't be looking at these things all the time. Okay. So eliminate the distractions. Take care of yourself. Eliminate the distractions. And then develop good habits. What does develop good habits mean? Well, it depends on you. What do you want to do? I know I, quite, I would quite like to blog a bit more. So OK, I've put the micro.blog app on my phone. And then I can always open that, because there's nothing else on my phone I can play with. So I can, op I can open that, and maybe by it being there and it's the only thing accessible, maybe then I'll develop a good habit of blogging a bit more. The, the his history suggests I won't, but you know. I've been trying to blog since 2006 and never managed it more than about twice a year. Never mind. That's fine. It's not a problem issue. So where am I? Oh yeah, totally forgot. Okay, so develop good habits. I don't know what good habits mean to you, but the, the, if you take care of yourself and you eliminate the distractions, you build a space in which you have freedom to develop good habits. So what, what good habits do you want to develop? Create that space for yourself and then fill it. And that, uh, there's an opportunity for self-fulfillment there, right? If you, maybe, who knows? So be diligent. Oh, don't touch that. Be prolific. Do one thing, and then do another thing, and then do another thing, and then do another thing. And each individual thing you do may not be very much, but if you do it for five years, or you do it for 10 years, or you do it for 15 years, it adds up. I remember when I started with Django. And there was some people here and some other people not here who were the big names. Oh, wow, I'd like to be like them. And well, now I'm the Django Fell. I'm maintaining Django. It's amazing. Not because I've done very much, but just over the years, it's added up to something. Now, I'm not a superstar developer, but it's like, oh, wow. If I looked back to then and thought that I would be here now maintaining Django, did Django Fell, I'd be like, wow, isn't that cool? And it's not that I'm super prolific, but I've been doing a little bit all the time for years. You can do that. Now, I don't know, again, just as I can't tell you what good habits to develop, I can't tell you what things to do. Right? It's, that's, your, um, that's your decision. That's your life. That's your project, your, yourself. Right? But the thing, I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to give you an example of contributing to open source because it's what I know about, and it may be relevant to some of you. Um, so contributing to open source, right. advantages. It's a good thing. It's, it, it has a low barrier to entry, in theory. Most maintainers, most maintainers are super friendly. And so if you can make a patch, you can open a discussion, and most maintainers will be very open to you. If a maintainer isn't open to you, just choose a different project. Right? There are millions. Don't, f don't get into, well, don't prolong an engagement which isn't positive on the internet. Just walk away from that. But it's got a low barrier to entry, and it's visible. It's stuff you can talk about. If you work for a company, and um, it may be that your work is under NDA. It may be that it's proprietary and you can't show it. But anything you stick on GitHub, you can just point to and go, hey, look, this is, this is what I've done. You go, people always used to, when I was a younger developer, people would ask for code samples. And I'd be like, I can't, you know, I can't send you a code sample. But as soon as I started contributing to open source, I was never asked for a code sample ever again. Because I just went, right, well, I contribute to open source. And you know, I point at rank, Django REST framework and go, well, I didn't write it, but I've I wrote some of it, and you know you can see the issues that I've triaged and the things that I've done, and that's enough. So it's visible. 
GitHub is, they say GitHub's not your profile, but it can act as a large part of your profile. It can, you know, it, it carries weight. Um, but isn't there a structural problem with open source? Uh, what's the structural problem? Big companies taking advantage of free labor. People building billion dollar startups all on open source technologies and contributing zero or f effectively zero back. Yes, there is that problem. Um, people have talked about this a lot. I don't know that I have anything to add particularly here to that. Yes, there's an, a structure problem in open source. How do we solve that? I don't know. What I'm going to talk about is the dangers of contributing to open source to you as an individual contributor. Um, the first, it's not really a burner, but it's worth pointing. It's a slow burner. It's not, you are not going to start contributing to open source and suddenly, just because of that, end up with the dream job at Google. Right? It, it takes time. If you need something now, if you need, if you need to get a new job now, and you need something to show off now, your best bet is a, a side project, a glamorous side project that you can put onto the Hacker News and, you know, something pr that you can do quickly and it's a complete thing. That would be better for a short thing. So open source doesn't work like that. It takes time. But that's kind of my point about being prolific, about take, doing it bit by bit. Um, if you contribute for a, a month, a few months, a year, oh wow, a few years, right? all of a sudden, something which was small and which was insignificant becomes, yeah, oh, okay, yeah, that's worthy. It. it becomes something to show, something to talk about. So it's a slow burner. But, but the big issue isn't that, it's burnout. It's the biggie. Um, you think that open source is all about writing code. Well, I like writing code, I'll do open source. No, it's not. <laughs> Most of open source is about triage. It's about responding to users. It's about answering the same question politely again and again and again and again. And it never, ever, ever ends. Ever. Ever, ever, ever ends. No matter how much time you put in. Okay. Um, you want to help. So you get sucked in. You do help, but you get burnt out. What do people say? Contributing to open source is interfering my work. Contributing to open source is stopping me from sleeping. Contributing to open source is stopping me from spending time with my family. Contributing to open source is ruining my health. Contributing to open source is making me depressed. These are all real and present dangers. Um, Sasha put a um, blog post up last week on a blog about um, volunteering to organize community events like this one and how draining and difficult that is. And she used a phrase which I hadn't heard about for, of Django called the meat grinder. So old hands on Django would describe it as the meat grinder. We need fresh meat for the grinder. Because a contributor would come in, do a year, do two years, all the rest of it. And, and then they, they get burnt out. Um, and this is the point of the Django Fellowship Program that we talked about. The hope is that we can let contributors, that's you, focus on doing the fun bit, the patches, the coding and we handle the triage flow. We ha speed up the, review, the patch review cycle. Um, and we do the security, and, or we help with security, and we do release the release flow. We do the boring bits in paid time so that contributors to Django don't, don't have to, well, get burnt out doing that. So what's my advice? What to do if you're going to um, contribute to open source? First thing is to limit your commitment in advance. How much time will you give it? 
Decide that in advance. Will you give it an hour a week? Then give it an hour a week, but stop. Will you give it an hour a day? Ooh, that's quite a lot. Um, okay, whatever you do. People would ask me, how do you have time? How do you have time to contribute to open source? Well, one answer I gave when it was, um, when it was trending was that some people play Pokemon Go. I play GitHub, right? That was, that was the line. See, I don't play Pokemon Go or any of the other things. I play GitHub. So, you know, if I want something to do for 10 minutes, I'll quickly look at the issue list and I can browse through and I can respond and that's my game. That's me developing a good habit, right? And if you treat it like this, as a game, right, then it gives you a simple metric. It gives you something to measure. Is this, am I doing too much here? Imagine instead of contributing to open source in all those sentences, you had playing Pokemon Go. Right. Well, if playing Pokemon Go is in, in here interfering with your work, then you know you've got a problem, right? You get the idea. Now, this isn't to say that people don't have exactly that kind of problem with Pokemon Go or video games more generally. They do. But the, the difference here is that there's no social expectation that we should be okay with that. Right? That it's the norm that you are addicted. That somehow we're failing if we say, oh, I need to pull back a bit because it's too much. But with, so, with open source, that's precisely what the expectation is. That you're letting the community down if you don't contribute. That's a myth, okay? And it's important that you recognize that. Because, well, it, because it's a dangerous. So limit your time. That's just self-care again, right? Look after yourself. Limit your time. Look, limit it in advance. Limit it in advance. Then the next thing is to get your employer to help. Stop touching that. Um, your employers should be using open source. You're all using open source, but they should be encouraging you to contribute back. What do they say? It's a much better alternative than building your own. Almost certainly, there's some Django package out there that does what you need. Give it a quick audit, make sure it's not totally insane, then use it. And if there's a bug in it, fix it. Right? It doesn't have to be 20% time, although, you know. That's fine. There's soft benefits. It's a learning opportunity. It's a growth opportunity for you. And for your employer, it's a training opportunity for you to encourage your staff to, in, 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 um, to contribute to open source. It makes them better developers. It helps with hiring, I think. I think it helps with retaining talent. Because all of a sudden, you, oh, we can't upgrade Django because we're using this third-party package which isn't compatible with the new version of Django. We'll fix the third-party package. Then upgrade Django. And all of a sudden, you're not using the, 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 the LTS that's one week short of end of life and going, oh, no, we've got to do new features and it's going to be end of life and we can't... Ah. You, all of a sudden, you're on the latest Django and it's exciting. You've got all the new features. Because you contributed back, explain this to your boss. Um, and again, they should be funding Django or DRF or whatever it is you're using. It's much, 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 much cheaper to fund these projects to get your bugs fixed than it is to hire a developer to fix them. So if your company uses Django, fund Django. If your company uses DRF, fund DRF. If you use Wagtail, I think they want funding now. Fund it. It's nothing. It's pennies. It's loose change for you. You've got payroll, right? Contribute a few hundred dollars every so often to a, an open source project. So let me just talk about landing a patch in Django. It can feel difficult. You find a ticket, you make your patch, you open your pull request. Yay, exciting. Then you get lots of comments. Oh, Remove this white space. This is an irrelevant change. Change the indentation. Fix the line wrapping. Needs tests. Needs documentation. Oh, God. Don't despair. It's okay. <laughs> the comments aren't meant personally. Right? So you, you just have to smile and go, okay, I'll make the little changes. Right? People are busy. Reviewers are used to just going through it. They, they just go, and they just mark off all the things that they see are wrong. 
Um, so first of all, don't despair. It's, it's not a personal attack on your effort. It's just something you have to go through. We want you, remember that. Django lives and dies by its contrib contribution, so please don't despair, we want you, okay? And to that end, I am here to help. If you put in a patch, part of my job is to support you getting that patch in. So if there's lots of comments and you feel upset about it, talk to me and I'll help you. I'm here to help. I'm Matt Carlton Gibson on GitHub. Just mention me and I will be there to support you. I will help you fix all the comments, address all the comments, and I will eventually go back to track and I will mark it ready for checking at which point Tim Graham will have a look and there will be more comments. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll be like, ah, oh, I thought it was ready. And you'll be like, ah. Oh. Again, I'm here to help. I'm Hank on Gibson. I will help you get through Tim's comments. And you'll ask yourself, is this necessary? Do we really have to have this massive process? Well, is Django any good? I'm here to help at Colin Gibson. I mean that. <laughs> I mean that. Um, so that's oh, contributing to open source. is a, an example of one way you can choose to be prolific. Okay. It's a slow burner. It builds up over time. But it can help, really help you. But be careful. Remember your self-care. And so the final thing I'm going to, the final tip is to be social. I don't mean necessarily mean Facebook. Like if you like Facebook, then that's fine. That's, a, you know, that's your thing, that's that, great. What I mean is to get out there and meet people, and we're all rubbish at this, but get out of your comfort zones and try. Share what you've done. Relish in what other people have done. Be a part of the community. Help build the community. Be social. This is a secret weapon. Right? If you're an employee, this is how you find the companies that will give you a decent job. So there are many startups out there who just want to kill you. They want to work like a, a Roman galleon, like with the slaves, the, 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 the oars. They want you to fill that role. But there are lots of companies out there which aren't like that. How do you find them? like this. If you're an employer, your biggest problem is hiring talent, despite the fact there's so many programs out there who can't find a decent job. Your biggest problem is hiring talent and retaining that talent. Well, how do you get out? How do you find the people that you are going to really push your business forward? Be social. If you are a freelancer, well, how do you find your ideal clients? Rachel this morning talked about defining your client. Who do you want to work for? Well, I want to work for somebody who's going to pay me lots of money to do not very much. <laughs> well, how do you find those people? Like, not sitting at your computer. Be social. Get out of it. It's the secret source. Be social. Right, but just finally, I think it also adds texture back to life. The aggregators and the algorithms, they, sort of, they kind of suck everything out. Hacker News is the same every single day. Still read it, but still click on it, but it's, it's, it's dull. It's like Spotify. You know, when you first load up Spotify, it's suggesting all these different things. And, but you listen to it for a while, and the algorithm kind of flattens, and all of a sudden it's the same recommendations every single time you look at it. Well, being social, getting out there, genuine interaction is how you get a bit of richness back in. It's one of the things that's so good and so refreshing about the Django community. The Django community is different. It revels in it. It cultivates it. Personally, I love it. So you want to program forever. Look widely. There's lots of people all out, out there that need your services. I can't remember the other point. Um, be diligent, be prolific, be social. Anyway, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>